So we are welcoming Professor Andy Nusa, Andrew Nusa, we can be called Andy. Uh, he's the director of the National School Observatory, he's from the University of Liverpool, Liverpool Don't Falls University. He's uh, an astronomer, astrophysicist, and he will tell us about connection between astronomy and art, near Salafi. Actually, the timing couldn't be better because you probably know, and you better know, that today was reported the first observation of the black hole. Mm -hmm. Instead of having this artist impression of a black hole, we have the first actual image of it. Okay? You've all seen it in this very picture with black hole inside. It looks exactly like uh, the artists were imagining it before it was observed by the astronomer. So maybe Andy will speak about that. I don't know. In any case, it's a nice day that everybody in the world is celebrating. Everybody who is not a physicist, everybody who is a scientist is celebrating this very beautiful observation. And today, in Wolfhampton, thanks to the IOP, and the support of our administrative people who are not there, we can get to organize this, we are going to discuss about art and astronomy. Thank you very much indeed. I'm just going to plunge you into semi darkness. Um, I think. Hey, it works. Good. Um, good evening. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here, actually, because this is something that's a little bit unusual for me. Um, most of my time, I work with schools, I do research, I teach undergraduates and so on. But over the past few years, I've started drifting into the world of art, which has taken me a little bit by surprise. Um, and this is essentially a story of my um, random explorations with, with artists bringing astronomy and art together. By the way, if anybody gets peckish during the talk, just come and help yourselves, it's fine. I'm going to start, though, with something a bit old. Um, 1959, C.P. Snow, Sir Charles Snow, published a report for the government called The Two Cultures, looking at the sciences, particularly the physical sciences, and the arts, and seeing whether, they were, whether there was any overlap at all, essentially. And he, has, he basically came to the conclusion that it was not much. Um, and in particular, he felt that there was a, a mismatch in the way that these two areas were viewed by people who were not in either of them. The idea that somebody wouldn't know about literature, wouldn't know about a bit about theatre, wouldn't be able to read, would be appalling to most supposedly educated people. But it was OK to know nothing about science. It was OK not to know what maths was. It was OK to be frightened of maths, all these sorts of things. Um, and that was the view then. And I'm curious to see whether that's still the case. It may not have been the case then. There are people who argue about this. But I'm curious to see whether it's still the case. And I want to start by looking at ways that art and science do, in fact, work together. Um, three various, three groups, three ways of doing this. First, essentially the simplest, is science helping art. So this is science allowing art to happen. Um, then we try and look at art helping science, so art actually making the science stronger. And then the most interesting one to me is both of them working together to create something that we can call culture. Um, I have a very broad definition of culture. A few years ago, Liverpool was the European capital of culture, um, and I got into massive arguments with the organising committee because they didn't want to include science. They were happy to include shopping, but not science. Um, and we eventually managed to get a little bit of science into the capital of culture, but it, was, it did take... 20, 30 meetings before they would agree to do this. So that's, that's a big thing for me. Um, and I particularly like this painting because it brings together both science and art. This is from Joseph Wright of Derby. Uh, it was painted while he was in Liverpool, actually. He spent several years there. And this is a very famous painting of the air pump being demonstrated. So inside this glass jar um, that's connected to an air pump, the air is pumped out of the jar, and the bird essentially falls unconscious which was a big experiment at the time. And, and it toured around the country. You'd get these, these people, this is the scientist, who would just go around and basically kill birds for entertainment. Um, the idea was they would put the air back in and the bird would come back to life and it would all be great, but they often got it wrong, um, hence the rather distressed child. So this is, I still think, this is quite a lot of people's view of science and art together. Um, not a good thing, necessarily. It's a superb painting, but it's not necessarily a positive view of science. There are some other instances, though, where science has had a very strong impact on art. Um, technological development is a very obvious one. I'll give a couple of examples of that. But also scientists providing advice, providing support um, and inspiration. 
And that's a particularly strong one in astronomy. But I'll start with just technology. This is an obviously technological piece of art. It's one of Anthony Gormley's works called Breathing Room. Never got to see this, which I'm really annoyed about because I, I love his sculptures, but this just looks astonishing. A friend of mine went and spent two hours just wandering around inside these blue lights because you needed to. Um, but it's very blatantly technological. Without the technology, without the ability to make glowing blue tubes, this would not exist. So that's a very simple example, but there are other ones going back hundreds of years where advances in technology have made a difference to art, but sometimes it's a lot more subtle. Um, optics, for example. This is a diagram of a thing called a camera obscura, which was used by artists, um, certainly from the Renaissance onwards, to just make painting easier. The idea is you'd be inside your dark box, which didn't have a hole in the side, they have a lens there, and what was outside would be projected upside down onto your canvas, and so you could just paint it. And that just made life a lot easier. Bear in mind that th there was no sense of the purity of art here. Artists had a job to do, and if they didn't produce a lot of paintings very quickly, they would starve. And so this was an incredibly important tool for them. Um, and it's been argued, mainly by Hockney actually, and, and people who work with him, that this has been going on for a long time, significantly before the Renaissance. Possibly even before, historically, we, we realised that these sorts of optics were available. Um, and so there's examples like this one. This is a painting by Lorenzo Lotto of husband and wife. Um, and the single most interesting thing in here is the piece of cloth. Husband and wife are frankly a bit dull. Um, but the cloth is fascinating. Because if you look at the cloth in detail, you've got a very nice example of perspective, but the perspective is wrong. You've actually got more than one vanishing point. You're only supposed to have one with these things. And if, but if you actually draw the lines, at the front, you've got these blue lines, which go to one vanishing point, And further back, you've got the green lines, which go to a different vanishing point. And that's exactly what you expect if this was created with something like a camera obscura. Because the optics were not great, and the lenses were very small. And so your depth of field, the bit that's in focus, was very, very small. And so you'd position your lens, and this bit would be in focus, but this bit would be out of focus. So you'd sketch this bit, and then you'd move the lens slightly. And this bit would be in focus, and you'd sketch that bit. But when you do that, you move the vanishing point by exactly the right amount. So while this is not proof, it's pretty strong evidence that Lotto was using optics to help with his painting as early as the 1520s. And it was probably happening before that. So this is basically developments in technology allowing artists to produce their art better and quicker. And that's a good thing. Sometimes there are more important changes in a way, but even more subtle. This is a painting by Turner. It's a watercolour, one of his early watercolours. It's of a waterfall on the Clyde. And for the time, it's a fairly traditional watercolour. It's very good. I mean, this is Turner. It's not going to be rubbish. Um, but it's quite naturalistic. It's qu quite sharp edges to quite a lot of the, 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 the paint marks. Um, but then, not long after this, he started producing works like this, which is a, the edges are a lot softer. You've got a lot more blending of the colours. It's a lot more fluid. It's a lot richer. In, in, in its textures. And as a guy called Peter Bauer, who's a paper historian, that really is a job. I think that's brilliant. Um, I discovered this because I was invited to the meeting of the British Association of Paper Historians. Great. Um, and he's pointed out that this was painted on a new kind of paper. It was developed between these two paintings. And the big difference was you could get this paper very, very wet without it falling apart. Paper before this, got it wet, collapsed. Now, if you can make paper really wet, you can do this. You can get these blurred edges, you can get the softness, you can just slap the paint on, watercolour paint on, and it will work. The old paper, it would just collapse. So suddenly, Turner was able to do this. Maybe he wanted to do it before, but couldn't. Or maybe he didn't know this was even possible, discovered it was, and thought, this is fantastic. So the paper, arguably, changed Turner's art, changed his watercolours. But at the same time, or at least just after, his oils paint changed as well. Now, you could have done this with oils before this, but he didn't. He did it after he'd done it with the watercolours, roughly. 
and suddenly you've got these swirling soft edges everything's blends together this is one of his most famous paintings rail steam and speed um got a bit of everything in there but there's an essence there's a sense of flow and fluidity about it that wasn't really there in his paintings before this and so peter bauer has argued again no proof but he's argued this and i think it's fairly convincing that if it hadn't been for that development in paper technology this painting would not exist this style of painting would not exist um, and so that's a very good example of technology possibly sorry technology possibly helping an artist to develop a completely new style of art and this is still influencing art art today you talk to quite a lot of painters um, photographers even sculptors nowadays and they'll these these paintings these late paintings of turner will be part of their inspiration um, so this has been going on for a long time um, but it wasn't until about i don't know 10, 10 15 years ago that i started getting involved in this because i got a phone call it's actually before people emailed i got a phone call from a, an artist called andrew small who'd been given my number by somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody and so on um, and he he's an artist he's a sculptor and he was developing a series of sculptures to go on a path that went from coast to coast it's actually a cycle path so it's coast to coast in the in the, the, the northern part of england um, and he was putting various sculptures along the route and he wanted each of the sculptures to be informed by where it was and this is the one at the end so this is the Newcastle end, uh, so the, the, the northeastern end of this walk, this, this cycle path. And what he wanted was something that brought together um, some of the local history, in particular the Venerable Bede. The Venerable Bede was big in this area several hundred years ago. Um, and he was one of the people who came up with the way that Easter is calculated. And so what Andrew wanted to do was immortalise that calculation in granite and that's what this is you can't see it very clearly but this huge lump of granite and it really is enormous has constellations marked on it and at the exact moment of Easter Sunday when it falls on I think the 1st of April um, at the exact moment that the Sun rises there's a point where the Sun balances on top of that lighthouse and when it does, all the constellations are in exactly the right place if you're standing in the right place. They would match up perfectly. Um, now, he wanted to do this, but didn't know how. So he got in touch with me, and I did the calculations. Um, it's not often, as an astronomer, you get your work carved in granite, so I did quite like this. Um, and and it was, it's lovely. It was good fun to do. We ended up with this huge lump of granite, and we went there. Well, I didn't, but Andrew went there at exactly the right moment on exactly the right Easter Sunday, and that's the picture he got. Um, so the sun is, in fact, balanced on the top of that lighthouse, but you'd never know because this is the north of England. <laughs> but you can go back in 65 years and try again, apparently. Um, but if you ever are anywhere near this, go and have a look. You can see the constellations marked on this. So this was just a little bit of technical help. It took me a couple of hours, no more than that. But I got the taste for it. And I started thinking, well... Let's do some more of this. This is fun. This is bringing astronomy to people who wouldn't necessarily normally interact with it. Um, doesn't take a huge amount of time and it's just quite an enjoyable thing to do. And then I went to see a play by a company called Unlimited Theatre who do weird stuff. And they do an absolutely superb piece about time travel, which I still haven't got my head around. Um, and the guy in charge of it, John Spooner, got chatting to me in the bar afterwards and he found out that I was an astronomer and we got chatting about this. He says, um, you know, I've been doing all these plays for years, but I want to do one for kids. I want to do a children's play and I want the play to inspire them to become scientists. Can we work on this? I said, yeah, sure. So I ended up working with him on a play called Mission to Mars. And this was a very simple idea. These two are the first two human beings ever to go to Mars. And the play just tells the story of their journey. Ends before they land, which is particularly exciting, um, but it tells the story of their journey. And to give you an idea of how this fits in, Stefan here, the play starts with him sitting on the front of the stage opening a letter. And it's a letter he wrote to himself when he was 10. And what the letter, on the envelope it says, to be opened the day before you go to Mars. And so that's the beginning. And the idea behind this is it, it, it's, a good, it's a great story, it gets people involved, it's quite exciting, but it's just showing that these two, who come from very different backgrounds, very different views of the way the world works, very different attitudes to things, 
they both ended up doing this amazing thing because they wanted to and they went for it. And that was the message he wanted to give to the whole audience. Um, it was a fascinating process for me. I was one of two or three sort of scientific advisors on this. Um, and one thing that I found particularly interesting on this was working with people whose skill is storytelling. You can tell immediately when you watch this that although scientists were involved, they did not write it because it doesn't have a neat ending. You end where they're coming down towards Mars and a siren goes off. Something has gone wrong and that's the end of the play. So you don't know whether they land, you don't know whether they survive. It's all in your mind. You can make your own mind up. Now, when I first heard this, I was horrified. You can't do that. When I saw it, it was brilliant because all the kids were arguing about what happened at the end and they were still discussing it an hour, two hours later. Um, it went down very well. It toured all over the country. Um, I think it actually came to Birmingham at one point. This was when it was in Leeds. Sold out every theatre it went to. Very successful tour. But one of the things we did was we had panel discussions afterwards. Some of the performances. Um, this is actually a kid asking questions. And this is the panel. And I think this t tells a lot about the breadth of the project. Because it's got me. I'm the tame astronomer. That's fine. Um, this gentleman here, I can't remember anybody's names, but this gentleman here, um, he's a primary school teacher. That's why he was involved. Uh, she's a social worker. That's Gail. I do remember Gail. She, um, she has an extraordinary history. She left school when she was 15 because her school didn't let pregnant girls stay in school and she was pregnant. Um, she had the baby and just went off to work in Tesco's, basically. But she wants to go to space. She's always wanted to go to space. So while bringing up the baby and working in Tesco's, she took evening classes and got her A-levels. And then she did a degree at the Open University. And then she did a part-time PhD at the Open University. And then she applied for the astronaut training programme. She'd had two other children at this point um, at ESA. And she got into the final 10, I think, which is astonishing. Now, she didn't make it to the final choice. That was Tim Peake. But they were so impressed by her, they hired her to do the microgravity training. So she, for several years, did all of the microgravity training for ESA. Um, she now runs a nuclear physics lab in Australia. But she still wants to go into space. She's still, I mean, she's going to do this. Um, there's no way you would ever argue with Gail. She's lovely, but when she says she's going to do something, it happens. So she's incredibly inspiring. That's John, um, the, the director and writer. Um, and she ran the theatre. So there's a very broad range of people involved in this. We were all there to answer questions because there were all these different things that people could, might want to know about. Okay, all of the questions were about black holes, because that's what tends to happen, but the principle was there. Um, and that got me aware of how broad you can be when you bring art and science and all these different aspects together. Um, and I just wanted to do more. So that was some examples where the science has helped the art by providing ad advice technical support and all that sort of thing. The other one that I think is very important is inspiration. This is particularly true for astronomy. Um, we have a lot of advantages in astronomy because people like it. It's, it's a bit weird. Um, you have amateur astronomy societies, which nobody thinks is weird. But you don't have amateur particle physics societies. You don't have amateur quantum mechanics societies. I don't know why not. I find them all equally fascinating. I've stumbled into astronomy, but I, I'm basically a physicist who's chosen that branch of physics. So there's something about space, there's something about astronomy that just gets under people's skin. So we have the awe and the wonder. We have these sort of vast scales and, and complicated time scales to deal with. We've got questions that we haven't answered yet. Important questions, you know. Is there other life in the universe? How long will the universe last? What is it made of? Um, and as we heard today, we have a new discovery, which is all over the newspapers. This is the first ever image of a black hole. Now, it looks like a donut. But this bit out here is dark because there's nothing there. This bit in the middle is dark because the light can't escape. Inside that circle, there's six and a half billion times the mass of the sun. It's an astonishing thing. Now, if Germany just showed you this picture and said, look at that, you'd say, hmm, it's a donut. But when you know what's going on there, you can begin to get excited about, about this extraordinary thing that we're now able to do. Um, I mean, 
if you pick up a textbook in 10 years' time on astronomy, this picture will be in it. If you pick up a textbook in 20, 50, 100 years' time, this picture will probably be in it, um, because it is that major a step forward. So that awe and inspiration is still there. Um, and also, and it's not an entirely minor thing, we've got pretty pictures. Okay, the donut's not a pretty, pretty picture, but this is a pretty picture, and that's inspiring. Um, it's, a, it's a galaxy called the Sombrero. You've got this beautiful glowing cloud of stars. You've got these wonderful dark dust lanes. You've got detail. You've got extraordinary things going on in here. But you also get quite abstract things. This is part of the Orion Nebula. The colours here come from the chemistry, so there's quite a lot of science in this. Um, but that is a beautiful abstract painting at some level. I mean, you compare it to a Turner, for example. Okay, it's not the same, but it's coming from the same place. This is created by a human hand and brain. This is created by a mixture of the human hand and brain and the universe, because the colours are slightly tweaked by people. Um, but it's talking to the same part of our brain in a way. And so we've got that advantage in astronomy. We need to use that. It's a responsibility in a way, because that means that we can take the fact that people already like space and give them the opportunity to find out that they also like science. Not pitting anybody over the head with it, although I will do that if necessary, um, but just getting them to realise that the things they like about space, the, the mystery, the scales, the, the, qu the unanswered questions, that's what science is. It's not just slide rules and um, pendular. There's a lot more to it than that. So that's science helping up. Does art help science? This seems to be a lot rarer. It's quite hard to find examples where science has been direct, the, the, the progress of science has been directly helped by art and artists. There are a few, um, and you've got obvious things like Leonardo da Vinci, who was just both, so it's kind of hard to distinguish between the two. But in recent years, it's become harder to spot. I'm not sure whether that's because it's rarer or, or it's just more subtle, it's less obvious. But there is one area where this is very important, and that's not science, but science communication, which is a large part of what I do. Um, everybody's favourite science communicator. Um, not everybody's favourite science communicator. Some people's favourite science communicator. As scientists, we must communicate what we do. This is not optional. Um, if you're not communicating it, you are not doing science. I'm very strict about this. You might be doing research, that's fine. But if you keep it to yourself, you have failed to be a scientist. Now, a lot of that communicating is with other people in the same field, and that's fine, but I think we need to be a lot broader than that. I think all science should be communicated as widely as possible. Now, again, in astronomy, that's easy because people want to listen, but we should all be doing this. And art is a way of doing that. It's a way that can help us to do that. Um, and this is important, particularly in astronomy, because if we can get this right we might be able to solve some problems in society, or at least help to solve them. Um, it's fairly well understood now that this interest in astronomy, this kind of liking of space, goes across all the, all the, all the boundaries. It doesn't seem to depend on gender. It doesn't seem to depend on ethnic background. It doesn't seem to depend on social background, socioeconomic background, any of that sort of stuff. All the research says that you pick a random person, particularly a random child, and say, do you like science? Some will, some won't. You pick that same random child and say, do you like space? They say, oh, yeah. They don't connect them, but if we can make that connection, we can help. And so that's essentially a lot of what I do. It's taking that fascination with space, with astronomy, particularly in school children, but now more broadly, and using that as a way of prodding them to realise that science, technology, engineering, maths, all of these things are interesting as well. And it's not just something that other people do. It's something that they can get involved in and understand and appreciate. Because it's actually not hard. We spend a lot of time telling people how hard science is. We're wrong. It's not. Getting funding is hard. You know, sitting exams is hard. Science is not hard. It's time consuming, but it's stimulating enough that that's worthwhile. So this is an important thing that we need to do. And I've increasingly started working more and more with artists as a way of doing this. 
And this started because many years ago, it became extremely obvious to me that if you want to talk to people and share things with people, um, you can't expect them to come to you and be talked at. You've got to go and find them, share with them in somewhere where they're comfortable, where they feel safe. Um, and one way of doing that is through art. And not just, you know, random artists, being quite selective about the art you choose to work with. So, for example, the first time I ever did this seriously, it was street theatre. For many years, I've been working with a group of loonies from Southampton who call themselves the butlers. I was a butler for a few years. And this was a performance, and nothing to do with science, but it was a performance that we developed for the Edinburgh Fringe. And the idea is we would go up to Edinburgh, spend a couple of weeks on the fringe, dressed as butlers, offering our services to anybody who wanted a butler, completely free. Hand out business cards, and we'd go and clean people's flats, help them with their shopping, you name it, we'd, we'd, we'd have a go at it. Um, and that was, a, from a performance point of view, that's fascinating, because most performance, the performer is in control. Even if it's improvised, it's the performer who decides what happens. This turned that round. The audience was entirely in control because we were doing what we were told. Um, and that was fascinating. This man here, Matt Fletcher, he's a lecturer in performance, and that's where this all came from. But I also realised that people found, felt very safe. The persona of a butler was one that people were comfortable with, from Jeeves and all that sort of thing. And so we wondered whether we could use this to get a bit of science across to people. So we set up the science butlers, and we basically bought some tea trolleys. Um, we got four of the butlers, and we sent them out onto the streets of Liverpool with tea trolleys. And they did science experiments, science busking, as butlers, doing things like making breakfast and doing science tricks with eggs and stuff like that. Um, and this was essentially an experiment. There's a lot of, increasingly, a large number of scientists who do science busking, physics busking and so on. And that's a very successful thing. But the problem I find with that is um, science is quite easy. Street theatre is really hard. Pulling in an audience, keeping them there, getting them to engage, not just stand back and watch. That's a really big job. Um, so the idea behind this was, well, OK, if the science is relatively straightforward, rather than taking scientists and try and teach them how to do street theatre, let's take some people who do street theatre and teach them a bit of science. And it worked very well. Um, we, the science butlers did four or five performances around the country. Then we had to dis, dis, uh, disband them, essentially because we had nowhere to store the shopping, the, the, the tea trolleys. Um, they were in Matt's living room, and he couldn't get into his living room for two years, and he'd finally had enough of it. So we, we had to get rid of the trolleys, and, and that was the end of the, of the science butlers. But it was a very successful thing, and it made me realise that this was something that I could continue to do. If I can find artists who know how to engage with interesting audiences, and they want to get the science involved, that's going to be a win for everybody. Um, just wanted to show you a few pictures of this in action. This is in the Liverpool One shopping centre, just after it opened. And the, there were four butlers, you can see three, four of them there. And in the course of one day, they talked to 14,000 people on the street, handing out business cards and website addresses and things. It was an astonishing thing. Um, it did take them two or three days to recover, because it's quite hard work. But it was incredibly successful. Um, and I just keep playing with this ever since. Um, quite recently, about a year ago, I actually, I don't know how this happened, but I basically got offered five weeks in the Tate in Liverpool in a room and was told to do something. Um, this does not normally happen to astronomers, okay? This was a slightly bizarre experience. Um, and I ended up taking a mixture of different things. Um, I looked at the cultural side of astronomy and I also looked at the research we were doing and I tried to bring them together. So the cultural side was looking at the constellations. Essentially what I did was I projected on the walls of this room what the sky would look like at that moment if you got rid of the building and the atmosphere. So where the constellations really are. So people could, and people could see what the sky would look like during the day. But then we had the constellations and then changed the names to different cultures. So Indonesian cultures, uh, Indonesian constellations, Chinese, Aborigine and so on. Um, and some of them were fascinating. They really got conversations going, for example. So to do that, all the dancers really had to understand what they were. They weren't just following a series of movements. They had to understand the relationship between space and time and mass and energy and how it evolved through the universe. So we spent 
about a week just working together on movement as it related to the universe. And that was a good start, but that wasn't what Jumana really wanted. This was just to get her, 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 her to sort of uh, get a feel for it. What she really wanted to do was really get an understanding of gravity. And so we started looking at orbits. And we got several dancers together um, in a big room full of balloons. And we started just getting them to dance orbits, just physically move in orbits. And we started off with two, sorry it's a bit jerky, but we started off with two bodies. And they were beginning to get the idea of how they move around each other and the idea that they're balanced around a common centre of mass. And they can keep that between them. And that, and that got them moving in the right speed and the right direction. And we said, fine, OK, we've got the hang of that. Let's put a third one in. And it all went berserk. And you can talk to people about the three-body problem, but if you've ever tried to walk it, you really understand what it is. And this was what Jumana got incredibly excited about. She said, OK, what I want is the audience to go through this process. I want the audience to really understand how orbits work and why they become so complicated so quickly. So we can, we can predict the position of the Earth for thousands of years and know exactly where it's going to be. But if you put a satellite around it and around the moon, you're going to lose it within a month. That was what she wanted to get across. And so created a performance which was half workshop, half dancing. Started off with the workshop. This is basically giving people lots of string and newspaper. They made balls of string and newspaper. And then they had various things to balance them on. They had a, a simple seesaw and then a big circle. And so the seesaw was two objects, and that's quite easy to balance. And then when you start having the kind of circular thing with more than one object, more than two objects on it, it becomes quite difficult to balance. When you move one, the rest move in odd ways. And that was the first part, and they were beginning to get a feel that things were complicated. Then they moved into the room next door, and there was the dance. And each member of the audience was a different object, a star or a planet. And so they were involved in the dance. If you were holding a big balloon, you were a star. Kids loved that. Um, and so they became involved in the dance, and the dancers moved around them. And all the time there was comments and instructions coming over on, on the music system. And the final one was, as people have got the hang of how things are moving around, the final instruction was balance the room. That was it. And there was a sort of, every time there was this kind of pause. I said, what do you mean balance the room? Oh, okay, let's balance the room then. And people would move around until the room was kind of evenly spread. And then one of the dancers would move and everybody would compensate. It worked. They got this. And then they came out and repeated the workshop. And suddenly everything was being balanced really quickly. You know, they would, somebody would come along and pick up one of those and everybody would just, somebody would just move the other one and it would work perfectly almost instantly. They understood the difference and how it worked just from taking part in that dance performance. So this was an experiment, but we now know it works. And we're developing a slightly more complicated version, which is going to be touring around the country fairly soon. Um, so to me, this is a very good example of bringing the two disciplines together, dance and astronomy, in a way that both of them benefit from. And the next stage, once we've done this next set of performances, is we're going to start working with dancers, with acrobats, but also with people with mobility problems, the elderly, to get them to understand how gravity works through their bodies. In the case of the dancers, to reduce their injury, and in the case of people with mobility problems, to see if it will help them become slightly more mobile. Um, so that's the next stage in this process, which is not something I ever thought I would do. You know, you don't become astronomers, an astronomer in order to help dancers not damage their knees. But the fact that this is happening is just wonderful. I love it. So there are a few examples of the kind of thing that I do. Um, there's one other one I want to talk about before I move on to the final section, but it's a little bit more extreme than these, because it started with this. Um, back in 2013, there was a Royal Horticultural Society show at Tatton, Tatton Hall. And the theme for the show gardens that year was Galaxy. Now, my boss, my then boss, Mike Bode, um, has some neighbours who are garden designers. They sort of drifted into garden design. Dory uh, was an English teacher who, when she retired, got interested in plants. And Howard is her son who's an architect, but he's very interested in unusual shapes and patterns. And so they started working together on gardens. They did an amazing one for Amnesty, which was all barbed wire and concrete and metal and vicious and nasty. Superb garden. Um, 
And they weren't going to do one for 2013, but when they saw the theme was Galaxy, they got hold of Mike and said, should we give this a go? And so we did. And this is the garden. And it's based on a galaxy. You've got the spiral arms coming in here. You've got um, um, basically every single part of this has something. Even the tarmac we used. The tarmac is not normal tarmac. It's made from recycled tyres, so it's very bouncy. Um, and that's a part of the galaxy where the density is very low and therefore the gravity is weaker, so you would feel bouncier. That's the idea, anyway. Um, we had an amazing week. Everything went extremely well. This, for example, is the water feature in the centre of the garden. You've got to have a water feature. Everybody knows this. This is a little bit unusual because the water doesn't come out of it. It goes into it because that's a black hole. Um, this, is, this is an air plant. You can see a whole string of those, and they represented... Um, a string of dust and gas which at that moment, while the show was on, we were observing falling into the supermassive black hole in the centre of the Milky Way. So it all tied together. It was a great week. And we got, got the gold medal, which is brilliant, and we got the most creative garden. Um, and it was great. We had a wonderful week, and we got to the end of it, and we were sitting in the tent, having dismantled the, um, the garden, and it was peeing it down outside, and we were covered in mud. And Mike said, well, that was great, but I don't think we should ever do this again. It's just too much like hard work. I said, yeah, you're right. This was, I mean, it was good fun, but once was enough. Next day, I got a phone call from Mike. And he said, you know, I said we're never going to do this again. I said, yeah. He says, what about Chelsea? So we decided to have a go at Chelsea. And we talked to Howard. And he said, well, OK, I'll only do Chelsea if it's harder. So what are we going to do? And he says, well, what do you want to do? He says, well, what's the biggest problem in astronomy at the moment? He said, well, dark matter. OK, we'll do that then. He said, but it's invisible. We may not even exist. This is perfect. So we spent, yeah, Howard's great. We spent several evenings in the pub just talking to Howard about dark matter. And we talked about gravity. Again, gravity keeps coming into this because it's the most important thing in the universe. Um, and Howard was an architect, but his background is in art. He didn't really understand how gravity worked, except in the way of holding buildings up. So we started talking about orbits. Um, we showed in graphs like this, where we've got speed against distance. You probably recognise this. These are the planets of the solar system, plus Pluto. Um, and so this is the speed that planets actually move around the sun. And the line is what you predict based on Newtonian gravity. And it goes to the dots. So this is all very nice and neat and tidy. Um, and that was good. That's a good start. But that, how does that relate to dark matter? Well, then we started talking about galaxies and the way things move around galaxies, not just around one star in a solar system. This is a little bit more complicated if you haven't come across this kind of thing before. With the solar system, we can treat it as though all the mass is in the middle, because all the mass is in the middle. The sun is 99.9% .9 of all the stuff in the solar system. It's in the middle, job done. You can't do that with a galaxy because the mass is spread out a lot more, but it turns out that if you want to know how fast something there is moving, you can draw an imaginary circle, and if you add up everything inside the circle and pretend it's in the middle, that basically works. And if you want to know how something out here is moving, you just draw a bigger circle and you add up more stuff. Um, so we can still do a reasonable prediction of what we expect to see. And it varies a little bit from galaxy to galaxy. But the most important thing is, as you go out, you get fewer and fewer stars. And therefore, the speed should go down. Particularly when you get out here somewhere, the speed should be dropping off quite fast. But, so you expect to see something a bit like this. The shape of the curve will be different, but you expect to see something a little bit like this. What we actually see is this. It just, I mean, the weird stuff happens in the middle. Ignore that. That's mainly to do with the black hole there. But this basically stays flat. The speed stays pretty much constant, no matter how far out you go. This is as far out as we can measure things, and it's still staying at the same speed. This is the edge of the galaxy that we can see. And there's only two ways of explaining this. Either we've got gravity wrong, and it doesn't work as Newton thought it did, or even as Einstein thought it did. That's a possibility. But the other possibility is there's just loads of stuff we can't see. And that's a simpler possibility. Not only can we not see it, we can't detect it, because if we could detect it, we would find it in this room now. Um, and that's what dark matter is. We don't know for certain that it's there, but there's strong evidence that it is. And that evidence comes in all over the place. So these are a lot more of these 
so-called rotation curves. And they're, I mean, some of them go up and down a bit, but basically they stay flat. And for most of these galaxies, this is the edge of the light. This is where the stars stop. So all galaxies, as far as we can tell, do this. It has other effects, this dark matter. Gravity makes light change direction. Gravitational lensing. If you look at this picture, this is a lovely image of a cluster of galaxies from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, so these big yellow fuzzy things are large galaxies. That one's probably about the same size as the Milky Way. Um, but you also see these weird things like that red dash there and that one there and this strange thing there and so on. Distorted. They look like weird distorted galaxies. They're actually normal galaxies, but the image of them has been distorted because these are much further away. They're behind the cluster. And all of the mass in the cluster is causing the light to bend and wobble. It's like having a piece of that kind of bottle glass, you know, the wobbly glass, between you and these distant galaxies. You get a distorted image. And the great thing is, if you know what you're doing, is you can measure the shape of all of these complicated things. And you can work out, essentially, what the glass would have to look like. In other words, you can work out what the gravity is, the map of the gravity, which tells you where all the mass is. And it's not where the stars are. There's a lot more of it, and it's spread out a lot more. Again, dark matter. And that happens even if you look at the whole universe. This is a kind of schematic of light from the beginning of the universe, the cosmic microwave background, travelling through the universe and being bent by all of the stuff it passes by. This is exaggerated, but this is essentially the idea. This is me measurements from the Planck satellite. So you, you see something different now than you would do if there was no mass in the way. And again, the amount of bending only makes sense if there's a very large amount of this dark matter stuff. And so he explained all this to Howard, and when we got to this, he started to get really excited. Because visually he liked this, but he also liked the concepts, the whole universe in one thing. And he eventually designed a garden that looked like this. This is the same thing but reversed. This now is the beginning of the universe, and this is a light box. It's a giant box with light coming out of it. This at the other end is now. So this we called the ocular, and you look through that down back in time to the beginning of the universe. And these are rusty metal bars, and they follow the path of the light bending through the universe. Um, being physicists, we didn't just get some bars and bend them. We calculated the right bends. Um, this turned out to be a nightmare, because it's bending metal bars, you need special equipment, particularly long ones like this. And the only equipment we could find could only put in one bend, and this needs to bend in two directions at the same time. We eventually found one company in Britain that can do this, quite near Stoke. And what they make is tubular steel chairs, like these things. And they need to bend in two directions at the same time. So we came to them and said, can you bend some metal bars for us? I said, yeah, of course, bring them along. Yeah. At least that's what the manager said. And we got to the shop floor, and the guy said, you do know how complicated it is to reprogram our system, don't you? He says, no, no, we've never done this before. He says, OK, when we put in a new chair, it takes us a month. You've got 50-odd bars, so that's a month each. We had six weeks. Um, and so we actually had to sit down and work out how to reprogram their system much more quickly. Um, fortunately, we know computing. And so we were able to do this. And now, instead of when they want to make a new kind of chair, they can do it in an hour rather than a month. So they were delighted. So it was a win-win for everybody. But we ended up building this garden. And this is it actually at Chelsea. Um, light box at this end, these twisty metal bars, the Oculus at that end. Um, even things like the bamboo, every single part of this garden has something to do with dark matter. So the, the bamboo here and at the back, the idea behind that is it, it's very wafty. It moves really easily with the slightest breeze. And so if you see it moving, you know there's a breeze. You can't see a breeze, but you see the effect it has. Exactly the same with dark matter. We can't see dark matter, but we think we know it's there because of the effect it has on light. So that was the kind of thing that went into this. The choice of plants down here represented the early universe. They were low, they were marshy, they were you know, more dense, basically. Up this end, that's a cluster of galaxies. Um, everything had something to do with dark matter. This cluster of galaxies, you've got light coming out of it, hence this beautiful seat. Um, this is the Oculus. Some of you may recognise this. It's based loosely on the detectors at the um, Large Hadron Collider in CERN. So that's modern, um, bit of industrial revolution in there as well. So everything f fed into the theme. And then you spend your in 
incredibly large amount of time and effort developing this garden and trying to install it in Chelsea, which is a nightmare because Chelsea is tiny. Um, you, in order to get the van in, you have to book your 10 minute slot six months in advance. And if you miss that 10 minute slot, you are not allowed to take your van in. It's that level, it's an incredibly difficult process. But we did it, we got this garden there and then you wait for the judges. Because yes, getting a medal or something is nice, but it actually makes a difference to how many people come and see your garden. A big difference. So you really want that medal if you want to share what you're doing with people. Um, and we got a gold, which is almost unheard of. Um, this, was a first, this was the first time Howard um, and Dory had designed something for Chelsea. And first time designers don't get gold in Chelsea. We were quite pleased. You can probably tell. So that's, that's David, who, um, who runs the company who actually installed it. That's Mike Milos, um, Howard and Dory. Dory looks a little less pleased. There is a reason for this. She was just as pleased. But Howard has a tendency to wander off when he should be staying put. Apparently he's been doing this since he was about that tall. Um, and the judges was co were coming round with the announcement and he was nowhere to be found. So Dory had to go and find him. She eventually did, but what she didn't tell us is while she was running to find him, she tripped over and broke her collarbone. So that is a broken collarbone. David does not know this, which is why he's leaning on it. This is why she's not smiling as much as anybody else. Um, but she was very pleased. So this, this was the icing on the cake. We thought, this is, this is great. We're going to have a really good Chelsea. And then they came around and they gave us best in show for our category, which has never happened to a first-time designer before. You can tell that David was quite pleased. He had that grin for about two hours. Um, this just meant that every single person who came to Chelsea wanted to see our garden, because there's only three best in shows. So if you're, gonna, if you're only going to see three gardens, this has to be one of them. And so it suddenly became enormously successful. We were on the television every night uh, on the BBC programme. But I think most importantly, this is filming for Gardener's World. And we've got Maggie Adderin Pocock explaining dark matter on Gardener's World. <laughs> now, when we sought for the funding for this, because it's not cheap doing one of these gardens, when, when we were going for the funding, what we, were, what we were trying to do was bring the science to an audience that wouldn't normally engage. And it was a very specific audience. Sometimes you work with socioeconomically deprived groups, sometimes you work with uh, particular cultural groups. What we wanted to do was talk to the rich and powerful, because that's who goes to Chelsea. Um, and so getting this thing on the telly, getting this thing out there to the, um, the, the Gardener's World audience meant we hit that in entirely. We spent the seven days there just talking solidly to everybody. Um, we talked, we know we talked to 14,000 people actually talk to them about dark matter. We know there was 160 odd thousand at the show, most of whom will have come past and at least picked up a leaflet. We had articles in national papers. We had articles in international papers. Um, I don't know what the Nigerian journalist was doing there, but a really good write-up. We did so many radio interviews, we lost count. I know I did more than eight. That's when I lost count. But Mike did even more than that. Um, and the official figures from the, the RHS for the global TV audience was 200 million people. This is 200 million people turning on a gardening programme and learning about dark matter. That we're very proud of because there's not very many ways you can do that. You might have a television programme about dark matter that 200 million people watch, but they already know they're interested. This was sneaky. And so that, is, in a sense, is one of the highlights of my, the work that I've been doing of getting art and to support science communication. But it's still quite one-sided. We've got art helping science, or the science helping the art. They're not really working together. They work to a certain extent in this, but I want them to be closer. And so I've been working with a, a friend in London, who's probably even less sane than me, and we've been developing something that is gonna go a little bit further. We want something where the art and science are indistinguishable. And we're doing that through sound. So Gavin, Gavin Starks, is a composer. Um, he works a lot with promoting open data. He does, he, I first knew him because he did a degree in astronomy, then he did a master's in computer music. He's got a very broad background. And we, for a number of years, have wanted to try and bring his two backgrounds together, the astronomy and the music, 
through computing mainly. And so we started thinking about what we now call a soniverse. Now, most of what we know about the universe comes from different kinds of light. There's a little bit from gravitational waves and particles, but essentially the vast majority of what we know about the universe comes from different kinds of light. Radio waves, X-rays, gamma rays, they're all basically different kinds of light, different electromagnetic radiation. Now, a lot of those we can't see, so what we do is we take that light and we convert it into something that we can make a picture of. So this is a supernova remnant. It's what's left of a star that exploded. That we saw it explode about 1,000 years ago. But there's more than one kind of light in here. Um, the kind of stringy stuff you hear that see here, that's essentially visible light. The pink bit in the middle is x-rays. Um, there's a radio wave in there as well, quite near the centre. There's a whole load of different kinds of light in there, all brought together. Now, our eyes don't see that, but we can bring it together and make it visible. And we wondered whether we could do something similar with sound. Now, people have been taking observations, data from astronomy, and turning it into sound for a long time. It's called sonification. Um, and there's lots of ways of doing this. One of these is just taking something, an object that varies with time. It might be an orbiting exoplanet, or it might be a pulsar. Um, I think I've got, yeah. This is what a pulsar sounds like. This is where you take the radio signal from pulsar and just turn it directly into sound. And it's slightly annoying, but you can compare different pulsars. So that's sonification. We started working on a slightly different one. This is a very annoying noise. I apologise for this. This rather bizarre thing here is the very first observation by the ALMA telescope. It's a, a sub-millimetre telescope. And this doesn't just take pictures. For every pixel on this picture, it's got a spectrum. It's got all of the different wavelengths behind it. And so what we can do is we can take the spectrum behind each pixel and we can draw it down here, but we can then map from the different wavelengths of light to different wavelengths of sound, different frequencies of light to different frequencies of sound. So you can listen to the spectrum behind each pixel. And you can hear things like rotation curves. So the red bits are moving away from us, the blue bits are moving towards us. So we can hear motion inside this galaxy. Um, so this was just a little tool I wrote for Gavin because he wanted to use this to compose with. He actually uses this as an instrument stands there and actually just moves the mouse around. Um, and we're working on different galaxies now. It's hard enough to do for one, but we, what we want to do is do this with basically any galaxy we've got data for. But this is still contrived. It's taking something, an, an electromagnetic signal, a signal from a, an ordinary telescope, and finding a way of turning it into sound. It's sonification. What we want to do is go one step beyond that. And what we want to do is build a completely self-consistent model for the universe where we replace light with sound. So we're, we're replacing photons with things we call sonons. Basically creating a new kind of physics from first principles. What does emission mean when you're emitting sound? That kind of thing. Once we've got that physics, and we're nowhere near it yet, but once we've got that physics, we can then take this soniverse and we can start populating it with astronomical objects or their equivalents, and then we can listen to it. So this doesn't produce light at all. It only produces sound. Now, there are some challenges with this. Um, I've had to reinvent the ether because sound needs a material to travel in. You can't do it in a vacuum, so if we want to be able to hear our soniverse at all, I have to have an ether. Um, there's also some interesting challenges with the way we perceive sound and light. One of the reasons I find this fascinating is our... Ears and eyes are very different things. For example, our eyes are very, very good at spatial resolution. I can make out tiny angular changes. Sound, it's much broader. But the frequency range of the eye is hopeless. It's tiny. If, if you think of um, light as being an octave on a keyboard, the sound we can hear is something like 40 octaves. It's a much wider frequency range. So the spatial resolution is hopeless, but we've got a lot more interesting information. We can essentially hear from radio waves to x-rays all in one go. And so we should be able to hear things that we can't see, but we should be able to see things that we wouldn't be able to hear because of things like the spatial resolution. So there's all sorts of challenges to this. Um, but we are getting there. And from Gavin's point of view, this is a logical development of the way music has evolved over the last five or six hundred years. If you go back, this is Western music. 
If you go back to the 1400s, it was still monophonic. It was chant. So the main important thing there was pitch. And then the 1500s, you started developing harmonies. You had the madrigals and the, and, and the Baroque period. And there, polyphony, harmony, it's becoming more complicated. You've moved on to a different kind of phrasing. Then you've got Bach and Mozart and Handel. And there, the harmony is giving rise to an idea of form and structure. There's a refinement to it. Beethoven, Wagner and Savinsky, it's symphonic. Um, it's much more complicated soundscapes. There's a very complicated structure to all the pieces of music. Then you start hitting the 1800s. I don't know what Glass is doing there. He should be in the 1900s. But nevertheless, 1800s, people start talking seriously about things like dissonance. And when people are describing the music, they start to bring in concepts like prime numbers. That reaches a, a, an extraordinary level in, with people like Cage, um, a guy called Trevor Wishart, who wrote an extraordinary book called On Sonic Art. If you ever want to buy any book on weird music, buy On Sonic Art. It's superb. And they talk about lattice and mass and grain and texture. They're the sort of phrases they're using to describe their music. So what's going to happen in the 2000s? Well, the next step is to talk about things like curvature, dimensionality, symmetry, manifolds, spin, the sort of terms that we use to describe universes. And so that's where Gavin wants to go with this. He thinks that this is a new way of coming up with a compositional tool, which is not writing notes on a piece of paper, but designing a universe and then listening to it. I want to do it because I think I'll learn something about the universe. Um, can we hear phenomena? Can we hear redshift? Can we hear stellar evolution? One of the wonderful things I've discovered is soniverses don't last very long. Um, our universe lasts about 14 billion years. A typical soniverse, because the speed of sound is so, so different from the speed of light, a typical soniverse lasts about an hour. So we can hear a whole soniverse in one hour. I can play with that, but that's the kind of time scales we're dealing with. Can we hear dark energy and dark matter? Can we hear orbits? Do these things have a meaning when we're talking about sound? Um, Gavin wants it, as I say, as a compositional tool. I want it as a new way of playing with the universe as well. Um, many of you probably have sort of sky maps on your phone where you sort of do this and it shows you where the stars are. It would be nice to do that and hear where the stars are. Help being able to tell the difference between different things like that. Um, partly because that will be an extra layer of information, but partly, you know, what if your eyesight isn't very good and you still want to know where the stars are? It's a great way of doing it. You can have the screen off so you don't destroy your night vision and you can still find things in the sky. So from a purely practical point of view, I think that might be quite useful. But the main reason is because we can, at least we think we can. We haven't got there yet. It's, this is very hard. I'm having to completely relearn all the physics and I suddenly discovered that everything I learned as an undergraduate, I didn't understand. I just thought I understood it. I don't actually know what black body radiation is. I can draw the graphs, I can do calculations with it, but why is it that shape? I'm beginning to understand that now. So from my point of view, this is the best way I've ever found of learning physics properly, um, because I've got to. We're making a bit of progress. I've got the beginnings of a cosmological model. At the moment, it doesn't have all the physics in it, um, so we have to arbitrarily create objects. This is a, 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 a couple of objects that I've kind of arbitrarily put in there. But we can change the age, we can change the way it expands, and you can hear the differences between these things. Um, these soniverses actually only last a few seconds because of the speed of sound I've chosen. Um, so as you change the equivalent of Hubble's constant, the, way that the, the rate that the universe is currently expanding, you hear that. You can compare two soniverses and hear the difference. So you can hear cosmology, which I think is fascinating. You can sort of see it in graphs, but it's much clearer when you're listening to it. It really is. So we're, make, we're getting there to a certain extent. We've got the cosmological model. What I need now is the real physics, the emission mechanisms. What is black body radiation in sound? What is line emission and absorption? What do we mean by things like synchrotron radiation? Does that have any meaning? A very obvious example of this is polarisation. Light can be polarised, but sound is polarised in a completely different way because it's not circular, it's linear and things like that. So there's a lot of complicated stuff to deal with there. Um, sound has an orientation in a way that... Um, light doesn't. Sound has a duration in a way that light doesn't. We think of sound as lasting a certain length of time. We don't think of photons as lasting a certain length of time. So what do I do with that? These are the kind of questions I have to deal with. It's going to take me a while. Um, 
So there's all of these different things that we've got to try and get to grips with. But it's starting to happen. We're beginning to make progress on this. Um, and I reckon in the next four or five years, we'll be getting somewhere quite interesting on this. We're not the first people to try this, though. You go back to 1690s, and Kepler was trying to do something similar. He felt that the, the universe, and in particular the solar system, should have perfection in it. He was a very religious person and he felt that if God had created this thing, there had to be an underlying perfection. A bit like the music of the, of the spheres um, from Plato, but slightly more complicated because he knew that that didn't work. The motions of the orbits of the planets were a lot more complicated than that. Um, and so he tried to find that perfection by associating particular musical sequences to different planets. So Mercury, Venus, Saturn and so on. And then he would play those musical sequences to match the orbits of those planets. It was a cacophonous mess, but that's what he was trying to do. He was trying to find the perfection through sound. We're sort of going about 300 steps further because we have computers to do the work for us. Um, but it's drawing on the same ideas, trying to find something underlying by using sound as a tool to explore the universe. Um, whether we'll get there or not, I don't know. We're going to have great fun trying. So, after a lot of detours, I'm going to come back to where I started. C.P. Snow and the two cultures. Um, this is a beautiful quote from his original report. I'm going to read this one out. I don't normally do this. but He said, there are two polar groups. At one pole, we have the literary intellectual, at the other, the scientists. And as the most representative, the physical scientists. Between the two, a gulf of mutual incomprehension. Um, I think that's a little harsh. I think it's a little bit harsh then. But he is making a point here. Very few people cross that divide because it's frightening, or at least it can be. But actually, I think we're a lot closer than T.P. Snow gave us credit for. Um, I've discovered in talking to artists, working with artists and, and then with me, that actually a lot of what we do is very similar. Essentially, scientists and artists are always asking the question, what if? That's what we do. What if this? What if that? Um, and we do that because we want to change how we look at our world. The drive is very similar. We also want to change how others look at our world. That's a push for this. And this is the most important one. You do this with imagination. You talk to most people who are not scientists and they think that scientists literally have no imagination. They think it would be a disaster if you had imagination. But if you're asking what if, that is an imaginative process. You've got to imagine what the answer might be before you can try and find out whether it's true or not. So this is very similar. And so I found most of the conversations I've had with all the artists I've worked with have been very easy because we're starting from the same point. We think in a very similar way. But there are differences and those differences are important. I think one of the main differences comes from the way we constrain ourselves. Art is constrained by the desires of the artist, the reaction that they want to get out of their audience, the emotion that they want, they want to put into it, the story they're trying to tell. Whereas science is constrained by reality. You can ask what if, you can use your imagination. If it doesn't match reality, you were wrong and you go back and do it again. So they are very different constraints and that has a practical effect on the way you work. Artists very rarely worry about the statistics of what they're doing. I worry about nothing else. Um, so there are technical differences here. And that is where the conversations rise. But we're all coming from a similar sort of place. So I think, actually, art and science are drawing from the same parts of what we do. They're coming from the same parts of our mind. We've just chosen different ways of expressing that. I don't know whether you will agree with me. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what questions you have. Um, I hope I've stirred a few things in your heads. I hope you've got a few things whizzing around that weren't there before. Um, if I've done that, then as far as I'm concerned, this is an evening very well spent. I would be very, very pleased to see what questions you've got. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you very much for listening. Do I have any questions? I've terrified you, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm actually not a physicist. 
I just read in my early year. You know, you have given a concept of, uh, you know, replacing uh, photons with sonons. You yes, sonons, so yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, what I basically understand there, you know, sound and light entirely different. You know, one travel through the electromagnetic. Yep. And one yep. needs the medium, you know. They're so completely they're different. Totally different. Yep, you know. completely different things, yes. Yeah. So how, how it may work here? Though? We don't know yet. Um, the idea is, essentially, you can think of a photon as a way of transmitting energy and information from one place to another. And you can think of sound as a way of treating, transmitting energy and information from one place to another. Um, they do it in completely different ways. They're created in completely different ways. But what they're fundamentally doing is very similar. Uh, they both have an inverse square law, for example. You double the distance and they get four times fainter and all that sort of stuff. So they're actually, although they seem radically different, actually they're not that different. But the differences make them interesting. Um, and so what we're trying to do is take those similarities, the fundamental things that are similar, and then build a baseline from those, and then take the differences and see what we learn from that. So if they were exactly the same, this would be pointless. If they were completely different, this would be impossible. But because they share a fundamental similarity and then superficial differences, we can actually learn quite a lot by doing this. At least that's the plan. Um, whether we will or not, I'll tell you in five or ten years' time. Yeah. So you say that the creation of the Soniverse really is a big bang, then, isn't it? It will be, yeah, absolutely. Um, bizarrely, the beginning is almost silent which is a bit, bit, bit frustrating. I really wanted it to be this huge noise, but actually the, the energy is, is too compressed and the frequencies are too high. But, um, but yes, it, it will be, um, yeah. It, most of the time, it's an extended fart, to be honest. <laughs> but we're working on that one. <laughs> Thinking hard. I do love the expressions. This is brilliant. If my students ever looked like this, I would be a much happier lecturer. <laughs> Go on in. Yeah. You use the term uh, microgravity training. Yes. Uh, what, what's that? Oh, it's it's because um, astronauts have to go out into space. Um, they're effectively in. It's not quite zero gravity. It's very low gravity, and they have to be trained how to do that. Um, and so there's there's two main techniques. There's going underwater. Um, because then you're, it's not quite weightless, but you move in a similar way. But the main one is a thing called the Vomit Comet, which is this, this aircraft which flies up very steeply and then just drops. And as it drops, you are in free fall. So you're basically in zero gravity. And then it pulls up again, and then it drops. Um, you can probably guess why it's called the Vomit Comet. It's not a pleasant experience. But that's how the astronauts get their training on how to move and manipulate things when gravity is not there. Yes, yes. Um, yes, so that's what Gail did for several years. She just went up and down in an aircraft. <laughs> Bizarre thing to do. I wouldn't last three minutes, but yeah. Um, so, yeah thank you. Can I just ask on the education front then? Because obviously mm -hmm. in today's uh, world of education, you have to make choices yeah. at an early age. Yeah. And that causes that. Oh, it does. It's a nightmare, yes. Where we, that doesn't need to happen in future no. years, does it? So yeah. It's a challenge. Um, this is almost impossible with the current education system in this country. It's a very, very hard thing. I was weird when I did my A-levels because I did maths, physics and English literature. But I almost broke the college timetable because nobody else was doing this. And they were taught on different campuses. So I used to have to run a mile between, in, the, 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 between these, these, these sort of in the 10 minutes between lessons. I was incredibly fit then. Um, so yeah, it's not a normal thing to do. Um, there are hints that's changing. Um, more and more schools are doing things like the International Baccalaureate or the Welsh Baccalaureate. Okay, the Welsh Baccalaureate has not gone well, but in principle the idea was so that everybody did a, more, a wider variety of things for longer. Um, the English baccalaureate may or may not actually happen, but it's got a similar principle. To it. It's being messed up by politics at the moment, but in theory that's going in the right sort of direction. Um, but most other countries are not as rubbish as us, to be honest. Most other countries, it's able, you, the, the education is much broader for much longer. Um, and so, yeah, in the UK I might be wasting my time, but if we can get this out internationally, maybe it will help. And 
the idea that you don't that you might have to be deciding in school but you don't necessarily have to stick to that outside school is one that we can get across a lot of people do science and play a musical instrument but they don't see they see them as completely different things if we can show that to them that they actually have an overlap it will make both of them easier so there's also that side of things you know my partner is a biologist who's just finished a phd in physics um, but makes most of her money selling art so she's got the whole lot in there um, but it's been very complicated nobody understands why she does this but she does it because they're all interesting and they all feed off each other um, and so yeah she's been quite inspirational in a lot of this stuff um, But yes, we need to change the education system radically Nothing soon. Really Excellent. Fascinating. Good. And uh, more people should be listening. Uh, maybe one day. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. I'm not going to stop talking, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? Uh, I will do when I when I'm a bit more confident that I know what I'm doing. Um, two three years. I mean, I'm happy to come in and talk about the relationship between the two now, but at the moment, all we have something is is a computer program that makes farting noises. It's not. It's hard to get across why I find that interesting. Yeah, fair enough. Um, but but certainly the, the the idea that you know science and art and all of these different air, you know, sport, anything, all of these have a relationship with each other. I think that's an important message, and I'm always happy to talk about that to anybody. Yeah, definitely. How do you envisage your soundscape being listened to? Do you imagine it in a sort of three-dimensional soundscape? Yeah, we're, we're doing a lot of work with virtual reality at the moment, and, and augmented reality, um, but turning the screens off. It's interesting, if you, if you talk to VR people, they've forgotten about sound because they worked so hard on trying to make sure that the, the visuals don't give you an instant headache that they've just forgotten that they've got this sound thing. And a few of the companies are beginning to realise that actually using sound to position is an incredibly powerful thing. There's one company, I forget the name of them, they're a very small company, they've developed a technique to exaggerate positional sound. So it's much stronger than it would really be. And they're folding that into VR games because if you're trying to shoot somebody and you hear a noise behind you, that's a lot more terrifying than if you don't. That's basically it. So people are beginning to realise that positional sound is quite an important thing. Gavin's master's work was on 3D positioning of sound. Um, so it's, it's a while ago now, but he's a bit of an expert in that. So, yes, I, would you imagine putting on your headphones and listening to it or standing in a room full of speakers and listening to it. But you could also have it on your iPod and just wander around. It's fine. It's, it's just going to be a new way of creating sounds that people haven't come across before. And in the same way that when you start, people started listening to Messiaen and, and early Cage and even Shostakovich and Stravinsky and people like that, the initial reaction to all of that was horror. Um, that will be the initial reaction to a lot of this. Hopefully, it will not stay the reaction um, because I think there's a, lot, there's a lot of subtlety and intricacy in some of these sounds particularly once Gavin's got his hand on them and starts playing with them. It's, it's astonishing. Um, so I think there will be a musical appreciation of this, but I think there will also be a scientific appreciation. And if we can do both simultaneously, that will be something quite new, I think. I don't think that's really been done before in quite the same way. Well, let's see where it goes. I've not spent 20 years as a hospital physicist, but when I'm not doing that, I'm a sound engineer. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you, you, I'm you, to see, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. to see where this goes. Yes, am I? Definitely, yeah. Try doing a little bit of that. Gravity's a bit too slow. Um, so orbits and things, yes. But the actual things like gravitational waves, you, you can make the, the chirp noise that a gravitational wave you know, from coalescing black holes makes, but it just goes chirp. You know. um, I'm, and again, it's taking a signal and turning it into sound rather than starting from sound in principle. So a lot of people do these things. I find some of them a bit annoying. Um, you get a lot of these things where people have taken astronomical data and sonified them and what they've actually done is they've chosen a key say you know C major and they forced everything to fit that key so it sounds nice and that's cheating I am not happy with that um, I tend to just take the data 
and when I'm sonifying it, I will just turn the data into sound. And if that sounds horrendous, that's because the universe sounds horrendous, and that's fine. Not everybody agrees with me on that one. So most people don't listen to my son sonifications. Gavin is the only one who does. And then he takes it away, and a couple of hours later, he comes back, and it sounds amazing, and I don't know what he's done. Um, so, yeah. I was just thinking, like, if you've got that kind of, say, universe on the wall, yeah. if you were to fire, like, uh, like your pen, if you fired it up to the actual picture, you hear different sounds. That, that's the kind of thing I definitely want to do. The other one I w I've always wanted to do this is having um, a room that you walk around. And as you walk around, you're, so you've got projections on the floor of things moving. And as you walk around, you change the, the motion of those things. But I want to bring sound into that so that you're basically hearing the effect you have on the motion of objects in the universe. But that's a separate, that's a separate project. That's the one I want to do at the Tate in a few years' time if I can get the money. Yeah, I think that would be fun. Weird, but fun. Yeah, go on. Did you find out about the seven figures? I, I never, I deliberately didn't find out. I want it to stay a mystery. But if you ever do find, you know, don't tell me, but go and, go and look up the, 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 the group of seven incompetent thieves. I get there's, bet there's a great story behind it. Yeah. Yes, um, are you interested in any particular, work in any particular installation of vision artists as well, especially if you get to the tank, the, as artists that go to mind, um, to Dutch, Lisa, or to Gina? I've, I've done some work with Lisa, yes, yes. Gavin knows her very well, um, so yes. Um, yes, she spent time living on his boat. Um, certainly, I, I, I am interested in doing that, but I, I tended to find that the, the collaborations with artists work better if the artist has a problem that I can help them with rather than me coming along and saying, we need to do something together. So I'm working with a Taiwanese artist called uh, Yu Chen Wang at the moment. And she has the basic problem that she's absolutely fascinated by science and doesn't understand any of it. So we just spend long hours sitting talking about this stuff, and she records it all, and then goes away and tries to turn that into art. And that's great, because that's a very specific thing that I can help with. But if I come along to an artist and say, I want to do some science with you, it's going to be contrived, it's not going to work as well. So I like that to be driven by the artist, if I possibly can. Um, so we haven't yet found anything with Lisa that really makes sense, but we will, yeah. There's another one called Beth Healy, who's a quantum physicist who's now become a computer artist. And she's quite heavily involved in this as well, because she, she's the only one who understands the quantum mechanics properly. It's really weird. Um, and so, yeah, we want to do some stuff with her, get an exhibition or two out there, but we'll see how that goes. Yeah. It's a small world, isn't it? <laughs> I suppose that the world of conceptual artists who are interested in science is quite small, um, but it'll get bigger. Yeah. Okay, so if there are no more questions, actually we have maybe for 10 minutes or so some time to speak to Absolutely. the speaker in a less informal way. So, take some, some that. so we close the session. I want to thank you very much, Andy, thank you. Professor Nissan. Fascinating talk, indeed. Incredible the number of lessons we learn from the point of view of physicists.